Production funding for Ruckus has been provided by gifts from Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, Hush Blackwell, and by viewers like you. Thank you. I just do it. <laughs> Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly in our topics this week. Kansas revenue and unemployment, one up, one down. Pressure building for a decision on KCI. And building a bridge between Missouri's two largest cities, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and look at what will be happening as the Kansas legislature goes back into session next week. Although a temporary budget fix has been found to solve the current shortage, legislators now will try to figure out how to deal with a nearly billion dollar deficit forecast for the next two years. To talk about what's likely to happen on that and other issues is former state representative and now state senator, Republican Barbara Bouye of the 7th District in Johnson County. Senator, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks. Thrilled to be here. As you go back to Topeka, based on what has happened thus far, do you see any reason for encouragement and optimism? I always do. I am the eternal optimist. Said that on the way here, in fact. And the honesty is that we have serious problems to fix, but we have a new legislature from a year ago, and we, we have moved forward significantly, what I call moving forward, in places that make more sense for our state. We still have the same governor, so that's a challenge, but I think that we will even be at a place when we come back for people to realize that we need to have enough votes to override on some issues. Do you think issues. he's about to leave? Do you think Brownback is about to resign? It is still in the rumor mill, and I don't know, and it's up to him. I mean, he'll he'll figure would, that out. In would, the meantime, we've got to move on. Would that make things easier if Jeff Collier became the acting mm, governor? Not necessarily, but none of us know because we have never seen him in that position. Yeah. So, but I, you know, obviously he ran as his running mate, yeah. so uh, it would probably be pretty similar. If it were up to you exclusively, and I know it's not, but if it were up to you exclusively, how would you fix the budget shortage? Easy answer. Uh, go back and have three income tax brackets. I don't know that we have to put them back to the same exact level that we had uh, previously before Brownback's plan, but close. But no one was arguing with three tax brackets at the time. I didn't have constituents begging to eliminate that. And it is a well-proven, uh, very vested, and what I would call more fair than a flat tax uh, way to uh, tax us and get appropriate revenues in. So if that tax measure is passed by the legislature, should it be retroactive to the first of the year? It probably will not be. I voted yes for that, but uh, it looks like we may be going just to a retroactive to July, at least on personal income tax, but retroactive completely to January on the LLC. How do you issue. expect the school finance situation to be resolved? By voting. <laughs> I think that we will come up with a new formula similar to uh, the old formula, but with definite, some very definite changes. I think the Senate's going to have a somewhat different position than the House, and then we'll have to obviously get together in conference and work those details out. Do you know how much more money the state has to provide to satisfy the state Supreme Court? No, no one does, knows. Does anybody know how much no. money the state Supreme Court says has to be allocated? They don't allocated? say. They're not saying. Well, isn't that a stupid is. way of doing it? I know, it's not your fault, I understand no. that, but isn't that a silly way to run a government? No, and I will say that what you have to look at is I think we need to be looking more at both inputs and outcomes and thus figuring out what appropriate is and directing more money towards those specific things to get people up to par. And so you can't say how much money because that's always changing. So what you need to say is what is your goal and target and then are you funding enough to meet those goals so and So the targets? legislature has to pass an increase for school finance and then we'll find out if the state Supreme Court believes that's enough. And I'm not sure that it's going to be about enough, but it's at least a start. Well, what's and it we about? know it's going to. If well, it's, it's not going to. It's going to. Money, it's going to it be about. Well, it's going to be about. There is going to need to be more money. I think we definitely know that. Uh, but uh, 
exactly how much. I think they may be looking more for how do you get, how do you determine what you should be spending and want us to say we are putting some new things in place to make that possible. Senator, we're down to just a few seconds. A quick final question. Are you going to try, is the legislature going to try to do the Medicaid expansion? In my opinion, yes, and I certainly hope that more people are listening to the people of Kansas who want that to happen. Is that not somewhat problematic when the funding comes from Obamacare and we don't know what the future of Obamacare well, is? Well, it certainly isn't going away anytime soon if you pay attention to well, uh, federal so, politics. Something may and happen with health care at Something the may, level. but I can tell you what's up for, quote, grabs right now, uh, most people I don't think will be in favor of again. And so, uh, you know, as Donald Trump said, who knew this could be so difficult? <laughs> it, it'll it is be, difficult. It'll be fun to watch all of it, and good luck yes. to you as you return to the uh, Topeka State Capitol for the next legislative session. Thank you. It's nice to all be right. here. That is Johnson County State Senator Barbara Boulier. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Steve Rose is a Johnson County civic leader and a columnist at the Kansas City Star. Gwen Grant is president and CEO of the Urban League in Kansas City. Patrick McInerney is a former prosecutor and now in private practice with Spencer Fain. And Denidri Herbert is managing editor of The Sentinel, a conservative website covering Missouri and Kansas news. Well, let's start here on the Kansas side and follow up on my visit with Senator Bollier. While good economic news from Kansas is rarely heard, there are a couple of recent reports that may presage progress. For the first time in three years, the state's revenue forecast is upbeat, projecting an increase of $156 million in tax collections between now and June 2019. The second positive deals with the Kansas unemployment rate. It's now at 3.8 percent, the lowest since 2000. The national rate is 4.5 percent. Granted, these improvements hardly obviate the problems, but do they suggest there is reason for optimism? And let's start with Denidri. Yes, sir, they do. Um, and I think probably the best thing that came out of those reports this week weren't just that we're, revenue is improving, the picture's improving, and un unemployment is down, but also that wages are outpacing um, uh, CPI. So people are earning more money, which means it's, it's slow, it takes a while, but that earning more money is going to translate into more and more revenue, and I, I think, yes, it's very positive. We're going in the right direction, and we're going to get there if we just play, play it cool. Steve, are you equally enthusiastic about what these reports mean? I think that they're important, and I think it indicates there is some movement in the state of Kansas. I must say that if you follow their, the way they estimate, that they have ratcheted down the estimates in the way they do it um, at least four times so that when numbers come in above estimate, they make a very big deal out of that. Uh, but it's partly because they have found that the expectations have never have not been meeting it, so they expect less. Well, Patrick, what could be going on in the Kansas economy that make these improved numbers possible? It's hard to say. Could it be point. anything it, the Brownback administration well, and that's, has done? That's what hasn't been explained yet. And and I I love Sean Sullivan, the, the budget director, who is Me who's too. left to be, be to say you know well up is better than down, and there's there's some progress on some. I mean he's the guy on the Titanic who says you know what it could be raining, so it's it's fine. This is a hundred million dollars leaving a $900 million shortfall, and we're not even talking about what the Supreme Court's going to demand for our schools. Speaking of the Supreme Court, uh, Gwen, uh, when I was talking with Senator Bollier, I asked her how much more the state had to put into school finance. She doesn't know. She said and agreed with me that no one knows. Isn't that a strange way to be running the government and the school systems? Well, I, I think the court is wanting the school system to figure it out and come with something that's an equitable process. And I, I think it's unfortunate and it's difficult for the school, for the um, um, government, for the legislature to figure out the amount. And that is kind of crazy, uh, but I don't necessarily <laughs> think I want to throw the blame back to the court system. Well, I think the uh, problem is that the, the... court is to blame. The court said there's not no, enough no, money the going into the school that, system. The problem is that the legislature did not invest enough well, to maintain to equities, the which court. created a problem that caused it to go force it into the court. Who has the unique perspective to be able to say what the law is, right? right. And, and I think what the Supreme Court said is it's insufficient 
efficient, and, and we are anticipating that you guys are going to be adults and grown ups and, and figure it. out how to fund But this it. happens exactly. every year, doesn't it? It's, a, racket. Almost every it's year? a complete racket. The court says it's not enough money, and then they put more money in, and then the court, and then they sue again because it's they're not putting money in fast enough or enough money, and then they sue again. It is a racket. And by the way, the Constitution doesn't say, the, con the Kansas Constitution never says the court gets to decide. The court gets to decide the law, but not the dollar amount. They well, can't it, put the a dollar amount in. Well, the court did in the Montoy decision which says the actually say, you shall raise this amount of money. I think this they time. They did, but then they I, rolled it back I, I, in their I think next this decision. time they were afraid, very frankly, because of all the politics that says, you know, the, that we should <clears> not <throat> legislate from the bench. And so, therefore, I think they said, okay, we'll compromise. We know you don't have enough money, but we're not going to tell you how much. We're going to leave it up to you guys to figure it out. Do we all agree they shouldn't legislate from the bench, though? I mean, do we? Can we, can we agree on that? I mean, no. it will be legislated they to, they if, to, if they, they only they appropriate, the if they only appropriate another $50 million, it's yeah, going to go back to the court and the court say, that's well, not well, enough. Patrick, you're an attorney. Wouldn't it be helpful if the court were to say, we suggest increases in the neighborhood of or ranging from I, this I think to that, this. That's I, I when think they'll you, get in trouble. I think you get right back, exactly, and I, I agree with Steve, you get right back to the point that that they come under fire for, quote, legislating from well, the Well, that's not right. their job. Their job is not to legislate. Right. Their, their right. Right. job is to judge and to... to well, to say to what the law, the law is. Yes, to, to, to interpret, interpret it. And say what it is. And then if it's a legislative prerogative to figure out how much money, exactly. they hand it back to the legislature. Exactly. Well, isn't the legislature's job to figure out how much money should be spent to legislate? Yes, that is. I think that's absolutely their job, which is why the court stepping in and stopping just short of, they shouldn't have said a dollar amount. They did in the, fir, in the Montoy, Montoy one, right. Right. and then they pulled back and said, in this latest decision, they actually said, we, we can't tell you how much, but more, basically, was what they said. You follow all this very closely. Do you think Brownback's about to leave? I know he's having a big party for yeah, people who I have do. been in his past. I do think he's about to leave. I think he might not be going to Rome. I think he might be going somewhere else. Yeah, well, Rome was filled. I mean, that position's been filled now. But he, there's but, already a but there's another right? position, and <laughs> I think he'll be gone by June. And I think this is a farewell party. Do you think Collier will make a good uh, governor? You know him pretty well, don't you? Well, yeah, I know him pretty well. You know well. I, mean, I, I know well. I, he's very much in the brown bag mold. Goes without so if saying you love, that you, if you know love brown back, you're going to love Cotter. Right. Okay. Raise your hand. All right. <laughs> the Kansas City Star editorial board has decreed there needs to be an election about the future of KCI, and it needs to be soon, like November. The Star emphasizes it's not endorsing either the new one terminal concept or the idea of refurbishing what is there now. At this point, the Star just says there needs to be a resolution. Star columnist Steve Rose, however, is enthusiastic now about the one terminal approach. A recent Rose column says the idea can be sold to voters, even though previous polling suggests strong opposition. This in contrast to Steve's view last fall when he wrote there is not enough money or television time or mailers to persuade enough voters to say yes. A public vote should be avoided if at all possible. Right. So, Steve, let me ask you. Well, this we're going to have a public what, what, vote. What, what, I still don't. What, what, I wish what, we'd never one. What, what changed your mind? I guess. I is the question. said in the column that the results, not uh, two results, the bond issue for sure, but not as much impression do I have of that as I do the East Side vote, where the quarter cent passed. And it passed with a majority, and the people, of the, the majority of the people who voted for it will receive absolutely no benefit. And I've always said that in the air KCI situation, that people who don't fly or fly once a year will not vote for a new airport because it's not anything that they really care about. Someone has to tell them that they should care about the fact that if we don't improve KCI, it's going to hurt the overall community. The airlines have stepped forward unanimously and said, we must have a different configuration in a larger airport if you want to add nonstop flights of any size outside, out of Kansas City. And haven't City. they also said, by the way, we'll pay for it? Absolutely. There would not, so yes. so I, I go right back to your column from November. Why are we having a vote? Yeah, well, I mean, if, if we didn't 12, have to have if twelve percent of the people in Kansas City use that airport. Twelve percent, right? Mm -hmm. 
um, then why are we having a public vote? I know it would be cumbersome to undo the ordinance and to, to structure the bonds a different way, but why are we having that, a vote? Well, the reason is because the city council passed an ordinance saying we will not take any action on KCI Correct. until Without it is submitted to a public vote. Correct. So, but they don't have the uh, a legal impediment. They could do it they, legally. They certainly could rescind that. But, but and, won't they have trouble politically? At well, least I mean, some I, of them well, who want to run again. I, 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 think, I think maybe so, Several but I also think that there's mayor. so much confusion about yeah. the airport. <laughs> Who does I, I think it, I think you underestimate the amount of work to educate people about the airport and I think between you now and November. Underestimate oh, the people use it. Gigantic. I was a flight attendant for six years. I flew in and out of Kansas City. I flew in and out of tons of airports. And I think the people, even the business travelers here, if you originate and end here, this is, I'm not sure the people that fly a lot would be. We'd love more flights, but. I'm not sure they'd be on board with one terminal. Being. You know why we're so, not getting more flights? We're getting we air, airlines. A, airlines are assigning more flights to smaller cities and with with smaller airports because the passenger experience is better there. That's why we're not getting more flights. The, That's one of the primary. Well, I think you're asking for the, a, a, a one <laughs> terminal airport is. Uh, for uh, a spoke and wheel system, and unless Kansas City becomes one of those, and I actually would love it if we did, but I would want an assurance that somebody was going to make it that way. Otherwise, we are a origination and, and termination city. Great. So it's the other thing is you flights. have uh, Councilman Lors, uh is supporting a plan that would not call for this major um, uh, re redevelopment of the airport with uh, one terminal, but taking the existing structures and creating a one terminal concept. And uh, her her plan has a lot of merit to those of us who have seen it. So you have a lot of stuff when you talk about educating the voters. You have a lot of options that people would want to consider that we're. And I think the other issue is that the city has not done a good job in clarifying how you address the local travelers' concerns about what we consider to be the benefits of, of right. our this, ease this of this travel. This and, right, thing, and, right, right. This can be, this. We, I, know, I know there are a lot of weak arguments We're in that. We're second from the bottom when it comes to wait times. Yeah. We're second from the bottom. Yeah. So when you talk about convenience, it's not convenient. It may be convenient to walk well, in. Well, but see, here's to the get thing. So you're talking travel. about, but see, to, I travel a lot, and mm -hmm. it feels real convenient to me, it and is. I'm still trying to get, because you know what? I don't want to hang out in airports. I don't want to shop Pat in airports. Patrick. I don't want to have yeah. luncheon meetings and dates in airports. I want to get in an airport and, and get, get the Patrick, hell out. It, isn't so, it the you civic know? and business community that wants a new airport? The general public is not fired up about this? I don't think it's just it's the civic community, the business community. It certainly is the airlines. That's, it certainly that's is. That's the key. It, it, okay. And, and exactly. Now, and if, they if, hold the key to how much if traffic the we're If there is a vote and there's the choice on the ballot, new terminal, refurbish old terminals, and the decision is refurbish, the airlines won't pay for that. Is that right? That's my understanding. Correct. That's right. Mm. That's right. right. They said we won't go into that. Well, and, and that's not just, that's not esoteric. That's about security. I mean, their primary concerns are about security at the airport. And right now, security is extremely difficult. They're also but concerned about expansion, expansion, and they right. want to expand here. But they and, are but expanding. You know what? Limited. But, why, yeah. but Southwest, early on, money. Southwest said they didn't need and a new terminal, I'm concerned that they were about okay with it. I'm concerned top. about getting <laughs> to the new topic. That's exactly right. We often hear the call for bi-state cooperation in Kansas City and end to the battling over economic economic advantage and instead working together to benefit Metro Kansas City. But what about intrastate cooperation? Could Missouri's two largest cities, Kansas City and St. Louis, come together for common cause? Historically, that has not been the case, but now with a new mayor in St. Louis, the first woman ever elected to that position, and the outreach efforts of Kansas City's mayor, a change may be coming. Sly James traveled to St. Louis to speak at Lida Cruson's inauguration at her invitation, later telling public radio, if you want to go far, you go together. So what would it mean if these two major cities joined forces? We start with Patrick, close personal friend of Mayor James. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know what that means. Um, Are you not? So so certainly, it's it's a great concept and it's, it's wonderful. I, I think 
uh, job number one, if there's to be cooperation between Kansas City and St. Louis, is to understand each other's cultures because St. Louis is fundamentally and structurally different in the way they govern their city than we are. Some people say St. Louis represents the eastern part right. of the United States. Everybody's Kansas heard city. that, right? The westernmost eastern true? city and the yeah. easternmost western city mm -hmm. and all that. And it is true because what 26 aldermen? Am I right about yeah, that? Yeah, I think that's so, right. So they have they have 26 kind of micro fiefdoms, and that's not a slam. That's just that's structurally where they come from. So when they talk about crime, when they talk about education and taxes and public transportation, they talk about it in a very kind of parochial way. We tend to talk about it in a broader way. Can we? Are those two general topics uh, able to be discussed? You bet. And. Really, the key is if these two cities are going to come together and identify common objectives, we have to reach to the rural legislators because they're dealing with tax issues. They're dealing with roads and bridges, which are transportation. They're dealing with an opioid ep epidemic right now that is devastating small towns. We deal with drugs in the city, same as St. Louis does. There's a lot of common ground there, but what hasn't happened is, and I think what some some rural legislators have done, is play Kansas City off St. Mm -hmm. Louis. And as fast as we can eliminate that as a tactic, I think we're in better shape. If the Kansas City and St. Louis delegations came together in Jefferson City, would they have enough votes to overcome rural opposition and suburban opposition? Well, it depends on where you stop the limits yeah. of Kansas City and where you stop the limits of St. Yeah. Louis. Yeah. And it, I think that that's an issue by issue um, matter as well. What do you think, Denise? Well, I. The, I don't see how any cooperation between them can really do any more than what they've already been able to do. I mean, there's a natural urban uh, constituency and a natural rural constituency and a, uh, a natural suburban, and the, I think they probably already do cross where, where, there's, where there's room for that to occur, but in general, I don't, I don't see what them getting together, and I, I don't see how it makes much of a difference. Gwen, could there be room for cooperation outside the legislative arena if St. Louis and Kansas City were to try to work together, business alliances perhaps? Perhaps. I, I'm not sure about that. I, I think back to the issue of cooperation, I think the big challenge is, or, I mean, where they can find maybe some common ground is around issues of local control, and I think you can probably get most of the city uh, elected officials and the St. Louis elected officials on the same page in that regard so that they can try to combat overreach by the legislature into the various decisions that we need to make locally with regard to uh, gun control and uh, local control of the police department. We should have been aligned with St. Louis on that. My buddy over here would disagree, but we should have been aligned with them on that so we could get uh, local control of Steve, our police what about when they at the did. federal level? Can St. Louis and Kansas City do anything there to have impact? I think whenever you can get <clears throat> two large metropolitan areas and populations together <clears throat> on any single issue, they can have obviously more of an impact than they can individually. I think. I hate to bring it back to Kansas again, but Johnson County and Wichita have talked so long about there's so much more in common with these urban centers than there's all the rural, and they don't, they don't get together. I mean, they don't find apparently, you know, they just don't work together on almost anything. And I think that's detrimental there, and I think in Missouri it's been detrimental by not having the two coalesce in some areas and go for it together. I think it's in, on a federal level, on a local level, on every level. Uh, Kansas City and St. Louis are rivals, at least on the athletic fields, maybe in other areas, and maybe that's helpful and beneficial. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of cute. It always should be that way, right? It's kind of, it's the, it's the cross-state <laughs> situation. But, you know, set, setting that aside, and that's whatever, that's great. Setting that aside, though, there are some real areas of, of common interest, I think. And I, I Like for what? And, and what? once that, crime, crime okay. policy. Um, roads and bridges, um, public transportation, education. I mean, th there's a number of issues. And I think once that dialogue starts, I think both cities are, are miles ahead. All right. Now we head to the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckets have 30 seconds each to elevate or devastate people and events in the news. And we start this time with Gwen. 
I'm shaking my head about the situation with, with regard to the absence of local control of the Kansas City Police Department, especially in light of the fact that, of this huge overlap in resources that exists because the Kansas City Police Department is still controlled by the state and the, and the Board of Police Commissioners. It's unfortunate for Kansas City because we could advance our crime, our crime fighting initiatives if we could put more officers on the street, but we're spending more more money on HR and other services that could be better managed if we had local control at City Hall. Now the former president of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Board, Patrick McInerney. Will not respond in kind. <laughs> well, no, okay. uh, Missouri Auditor Nicole Galloway uh, this week released an audit that identified some $26,000 in improper and unlawful fines levied against the citizens of Ferguson, Missouri. She is the only voice in state government right now who is holding to account agencies like the Ferguson Police Department and uh, blowing the whistle on that kind of conduct. So cheers to her. I have it listed that Denidri is next, but that's wrong. It should be Steve. I'm sorry. I'm curve. sorry. Go ahead. Like Pluto? Uh, no, well, it actually should be <laughs> all right. Steve. I'll take, you, I'll take my turn. Right. Uh, no, so there's a new law in Kansas that the governor signed that's going to allow for more regulation of amusement facilities like Schlitterbahn. And uh, I just want to roast uh, State Senator Mary Pilcher Cook, who for some reason voted present. She couldn't even vote yes on something like that after the tragedy that we've had here in this community. I don't get it. She deserves a roast. Denidri. Uh I would like to uh, reserve my roast for ESPN, who fired 100 uh, on it. Well, they laid off 100 people yesterday, I believe. Uh, they're hemorrhaging viewers. They're hemorrhaging staff. They're hemorrhaging money. Some of that is due to their business model, which uses subscribers through cable. And I think the other is due to their politi politicizing sports, which is a shame. And finally, here's a toast to the Kansas City Symphony for its excellent program a couple of weeks ago featuring music from the James Bond movies. Bond movie titles often suggest political analogies. Hillary's presidential campaigns bring to mind You Only Live Twice or maybe better on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Some of President Trump's advisors are in my thoughts when I hear from Russia with love. And for the plaintiffs in the Kansas school finance case who always demand more money, the perfect bond title may be The World Is Not Enough. And that's Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckets and the crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night.